This is week four of our seven-week lecture series entitled Deep Time, Global Change, and You. And we're getting closer and closer to the you because this week we will get into archaeology. Kathy Whitlock last week brought us up closer to the present and uh, we'll get very close to the present, I think, um, this evening. Uh, it's a real honor to introduce uh, a colleague, though it's hard for me to say a colleague because he's a very senior colleague. Um, Professor Rolf Matthews was one of the first students to go to SFU. He started the year SFU started in 1965, so he is a charter student of Simon Fraser University. Um, he's originally from Germany, came over when he was nine. Um, he graduated in 1969, and he said he managed to avoid all of the political turmoil that was going on at SFU in those first few years. Um, as also often happens, he started off as a zoologist, but a good uh, professor and some serendipity moved him from zoology to botany and from botany to paleobotany. And he went and did his PhD uh, at UBC, and that's starting in 1969. Finished that in 73. Then he went and did a postdoc at Cambridge uh, in the UK. Came back, and in 1975, uh, he was hired uh, back at SFU. And he's had a long and illustrious career at SFU since then. Uh, he has been the editor of this, the past president of that, the president of this. Um, he has written books, uh, hundreds of uh, articles. Um, I think perhaps most uh, strikingly, uh, in 2011, the SFU uh, University Alumni Association awarded him uh, their 2011 award for academic achievement, and we're going to see why he got that award now um, as he presents the human footprint in the Pacific Northwest from the deep past to the present, please join me in welcoming Professor Rolf Matthews. Thanks, Arne, for that introduction. And it has been a long time, and uh, you can tell by my hair, it's, it's been a long road. But I've enjoyed it all the way. And my talk today, it's because all the talks in this series have some connection with paleoecology, dealing with environments of the past and what they can tell us about the present and the future. And my talk uh, focuses on the Pacific Northwest, and I'll try to take you from the Ice Age to the, to the present, focusing on how people had interacted with the environment. And so archaeology, earth sciences, and biology all sort of commingle uh, in the area of paleoecology, and that's where I'm going to focus. And I'm going to start by thanking various people, because I'm, I'm not an archaeologist by training, but I'm using work that other people, such as Daryl Fedgie, uh, and, and many others have, have published and, and talked to me about and that I've worked with, and also other paleoecologists and geologists listed here. So I want to acknowledge their help, and the errors are all mine. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about three different stories, so I want to get going fairly quickly. These three stories are, and I'm going to give you the conclusions first, another weird thing, because then you kind of know where I'm going and whether the evidence supports what I'm going to conclude. And the first conclusion is that the Pacific Northwest Coast was habitable well before the interior, which is the classical mode of entry into the, into the Americas by the first peoples, and likely the earliest route of entry. Um, secondly, I'm gonna switch from that, and that'll be the longest talk, I'm gonna switch from that to another controversy, which is how climate and forest change have interacted with human culture and actually promoted aspects of Aboriginal culture in British Columbia and the coast. And the third point is, that although classic archaeology has always assumed that people of the West Coast were primarily hunters, gatherers, and fishermen, there is now a mounting evidence, and I think convincing evidence, that in fact some of them were farmers as well. And I'll give you the evidence for that. And that hasn't been published yet, but I have permission from the Keitsi Native Band to talk about this because it'll be published at some point. Okay, but before I do that, two quick comments about two techniques. Pollen analysis is kind of the technique that I used mostly in reconstructing environments. And you know, pollen grains produced by various kinds of plants, produced in large quantities, end up at the bottoms of some lakes and the oceans and other places. And these lakes sometimes form during or right after the Ice Age. And the muds on the bottom actually are like a book. They record over time the changing vegetation around that lake. And we can collect a core like that from boats using hand coring equipment. And when you get a core like this of mud that goes right to the, the end of the Ice Age, and you start analyzing the samples all the way up, you get a complete history 
uh, called a pollen diagram um, of that at site. And pollen is useful for various reasons. One, it's abundantly produced, particularly for certain wind-pollinated plants. And in fact, wind-pollinated plants that also give you allergies are called by Encyclopedia Britannica nature's fingerprints because of this. Even though they're microscopic, you can't see them with the naked eye. They have beautiful, variable shapes, sizes, and patterns on them, but you can identify species. Sometimes species, sometimes genera, sometimes only families, but they're identifiable and you can record what plants were there. Um, and they obviously preserve well over thousands and millions of years, particularly in wet environments like the bottoms of oceans and peat bogs and, and the like. So what can you do when you analyze pollen? Here's a pollen diagram. I'm not going to show you many of these because they're full, too full of data. But for example, this is a site on Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands, that a PhD student of mine worked on for his PhD back in the 80s. And it shows that clearly from this particular site, from the bottom to this point here, between about 18,000, and I'm going to talk about dates in a moment, to between 14,000 years, the first 4,000 years after the ice retreated, we had tundra, treeless tundra, and here tree pollen types, and there's very few of them, almost none down here. And then about 14,000 years ago, there's a peat here, dark peat, and it changed to forest up to the present day. So these sorts of vegetation changes and implied climate changes can be reconstructed from the pollen. So we can actually get a pretty good view of what was this environment like just based by looking through the microscope. And at this time, 18,000 years ago, it would have been a tundra, grasses and sedges, no trees, um, and things like dwarf willows. Here are actual fossil leaves and, and twigs of dwarf willows, which now on Haida Gwaii are found in only one mountaintop. They're, they were found everywhere, but now they're essentially gone. Uh, crowberries. Uh, this is crowberry heath in the Aleutian Islands, way up north in Alaska. Very common plant and also edible. And rare things like, though here's a pollen grain of Jacob's ladder, polemonium. Uh, so we get a pretty good picture of both the dominance and some of the rare plants that form these environments. Radiocarbon dating is important for the, my story because when someone says some, such and such happened 6,000 years ago, what does that mean? The first question I ask them, are you talking about radiocarbon years or are you talking about real years? Because there are two different ways. And this is very important when you're reading newspaper articles or hearing somebody talk about thousands of years ago. Um, calibrated normal radiocarbon eights, uh, showing up in white here, are called radiocarbon years BP. And BP before present is taken as convention by 1950. So everything goes back to 1950. Then you can also get a date that's a calibrated age, which is the same as a calendar year. And that's what most people are familiar with, of course. And there are two different dates, although the, first, the last 2,000 years, they're about the same. There's no difference. The 2,000 years works both ways. But as you get back in time, uh, in other words, by about 10,000 years ago, much older samples, the calendar of real age is about 1,400 years older than the radiocarbon age. And all dates that are calibrated are older than radiocarbon dates. So, and in fact, when you get into the Ice Age, it can be as much as 3,500 to 4,000 years different. So very important to know what kind of date you're talking about. And I'm going to use yellow to highlight calendar years. So we're all talking about the same thing. And that's important to remember. OK, let's start with Beringia. During the last Ice Age, you all know that North America and Siberia were connected by land in an unglaciated area and a land that's been called Beringia. And the Bering Straits are just right here between Alaska and, and Siberia. But this whole area was one large connected landmass that allowed animals and presumably people to migrate in both directions in theory. If you blow that up and look at uh, over here, this map does not show that during the last ice age, much of Canada was in fact under ice, shown in white here. And Alaska, Asia, and the yellow, the Bering Land Bridge, this continuous land, connected between Alaska and the Yukon and, uh, to Asia. So, but there was this huge barrier to prevent anybody getting into the unglaciated parts of Washington, Oregon, and further south. And then XY is this controversial zone called the XY, the ice-free corridor that we'll get to in a moment. OK, this Beringia was a wonderful landscape because we have abundant fossils of many of the extinct megafauna. This is a, no, they were not this density, I'm certain. This is from National Geographic. But the, you all know the woolly mammoths were here, the extinct steppe bison, which don't, doesn't live in this area now, and predators like lions and grizzly bears and 
this extinct short-faced bear. And short-faced bear was, a, uh, was an interesting character. But here, for example, I'm in the Klondike in the Yukon, uh, the gold fields of the Klondike. And in fact, most of the fossils of mammoths and bison come from washing the gold, uh, the muck that overlies the gold bearing gravels. And here in my hand, I've got a molar tooth of a mammoth. And in my other hand, I've got a large jawbone of one of the giant step bison. And you don't want to meet a short-faced bear. I'm glad they're kind of extinct. Here's one sort of scale to human height. And this one looks like he, I owe him money or something, but he doesn't look happy at all. And uh, the very long legs, he would have been a formidable runner. I, you couldn't have outrun this guy. And he was probably one of the, the strongest predators of this time period. And then in this Beringian sphere, somewhere, sometime, who, when, and how people migrated from Asia into, North, into the Americas. And there's lots of debate. I'm not going to get, try to get caught up in it. But the prevailing view from the 1930s up until maybe 20 years ago was that they came through what's called the ice-free corridor, this XY zone I'm going to talk about more, and that the first people in the Americas were the makers of the Clovis culture, a very distinct archaeological point. And the earliest sites are dated at about 13,000 calendar years ago. OK, remember that date. That's an important time to remember. So about 13,000 years ago, we have evidence. Now, if you're a zoologist, I know everyone looks at the mammoth. They think that's great. If you're an archaeologist, you're looking at this guy and what kind of point he's got on the end of his spear, because that's very important to archaeologists. Being a botanist, I'm always looking at what kind of plants are they reconstructing in here? And what's he lying on? Is that a, a heath or, a, or an artemisia or something? So I have a very weird look. But you know, all three are important, but my focus is on the plants. And here's a, a view of the ice-free corridor done in sort of in a sketchy fashion. And this is the prevailing view for many archaeologists for a lot of time. Here's Beringia, Alaska, the Yukon up here. Uh, and then you have this corridor between the two major ice sheets when they started to separate. The Cordilleran ice sheet over the, the, the coast and the Laurentide ice sheet centered over Hudson's Bay. And when they started to melt and pull back, this corridor opened up, presumably sometime around 14,000 calendar years ago. And, this, and people immediately from up here charged down through this long highway to a place called Clovis, New Mexico. Where, and these spots here are all where you find these typical Clovis points with this sort of flute taken out the base where you could uh, haft it onto a spear or an atlatl or some other projectile point. And bone projectile points are also common. Um, now, Knut, Fl Knut Fladmark at Simon Fraser did not think this was the best view based on the evidence, because it also had this weird connection that the, the assumption was that the coast, like shown in this diagram, was totally covered by ice and therefore was not available and people could have come down this corridor when the ice was covering the coast. But actually, the story is reversed. The evidence points in the absolute opposite direction. And the ice-free corridor runs through the minds of early, most early man specialists, if not in reality, like a highway beckoning paleo Indians south from Beringia. So Knut, you know, this view, <laughs> this view of, of you know, two giant ice sheets and you got this road going for 1,000 kilometers south and people immediately found this road, charged down it. You know, in reality, if you know anything about glacial geology, between two melting ice sheets, there's going to be glacial lakes, rivers, terrible landscape, cold winds coming off. This was not a habitable landscape even if the corridor was open. This was no man's land. And uh, you know, I don't think people with their grandmothers and children were chasing anything down the ice recorder at that time. So what are the options? And here, the coastal migration route is what Knut Fladmark really elaborated from Simon Fraser. And Knut, here's a picture of Knut in 1979 for his thesis. But the idea actually goes back to 1960s to Calvin Heuser from New York University. And here he is in the Queen Charlotte Islands uh, rub a dub dub three men in the boat, Cal Heuser, I'm rowing, and Brother Jurgen, who's in, also in the audience, was, was assisting on the, some field work in the Queen Charlottes. But Knut said boats were the way to go. And the coast, uh, maybe not all boats, but partly land. And he viewed that Kodiak Island, parts of the Aleutians, parts of the Alexander Archipelago, the, the panhandle of Alaska, parts of the Queen Charlotte Islands, parts of northern Vancouver Island were ice free, maybe throughout the last glacial period, um, or shortly thereafter, while this ice-free corridor was definitely a road closed, was not available. So the story is probably opposite of, of how most early man specialists have viewed it. 
Um, so now the question becomes, really, what is the evidence that people and environments were suitable for human migration on the coast? In fact, Hoyser's view was that even if you go up to Alaska today, where glaciers come down to, to the ocean, they spread out as ice sheets and they calve off as, as, uh, as icebergs and break up. They don't build up and build a huge wall on the coast because they break up and they hit the water. And in between glaciers that run into tidewater, there might have been ice-free areas called um, headlands between them that were suitable for people to stop over. And even if the glaciers were insurmountably large, if they had boats, skin boats like Eskimos and others, they could have skirted around uh, glaciers at that time. And how early would have this, uh, this all been possible? And the best evidence we have for how this was possible is from work done by Daryl Fedgey uh, from Parks Canada and a number of other people from the Geological Survey of Canada who come up with this map which shows this area shown in green is the present landscape of British Columbia. Vancouver Island, uh, Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands. But during most of the Ice Age, up to about 11,000 years ago, we have this gray area. This is all the continental shelf that was actually exposed as dry land. Um, and there are some discoveries here that are worth mentioning. The oldest human remains on the coast are up here on Prince of Wales Island, north of Haida Gwaii, Pet 408 Cave, dated 11,230 years ago. And when they analyzed the, the, the carbon isotopes of the food that this person was eating, it was basically a seafood eater. This was not an interior hunter. This was a, a maritime person who was eating seafood. Um, here on the Haida Gwaii, there are caves with bare bones over 16,700 years old that has been continuously ice-free since then. And where bears can live, which are large omnivores, just like humans, people could have lived as well. Doesn't prove they were there, of course. Um, and much has been done about this drowned continental shelf. And here at Werner Bay, in the southern South Moresby area, Daryl Fedgey came up with, in 1998, with a human artifact about uh, 53 meters, over 150 feet down on, an, uh, on a landscape that is now underwater. And the evidence has been mounting that, in fact, there was a maritime culture, people who knew about boats and seafood and hunting sea animals before 10,000 years ago. And this is the work of uh, Daryl Fedgey, Quentin Mackey, and, and many others. But this work here for Cook Bank on North Vancouver Island, the exploration of the actual seafloor was amazing because here, using this vibracore, this is the uh, Coast Guard ship Vector, they were drilling, actually looking for gold on the drowned landscapes underneath on Cook Bank. And they happened to core right through an old soil. You can see this looks like a garden soil, a terrestrial soil, and right through a plant. And these are roots of, a, of spruce that was growing uh, about 11,000 years on the seafloor, 95 meters down, over 300 feet under the ocean. So we know this landscape underneath the ocean now. It's like an Atlantis. It's a lost world was dry land, it had trees and plants on it, developed soils, and then about 11,500 uh, 11, years ago, at this site, you can see how it changes from this brown soil to this beach sand with, uh, with uh, shells in it where the ocean was coming up and, and drowned this landscape again. And this applies to much of the coast at various times. And here's a detail of the work done by Fedgy and others uh, in this South Mosby area. This is a, uh, a detailed reconstruction based on submarine uh, acoustics of what the landscape looks like on the sea floor. And at this, you can see here, this is where a stream came in, goes down, and here's an actual delta where the stream fanned out. And they were looking for where would people have been if they were actually on this landscape then. And they did grab samples using these, these dredges which grabbed the bottom to see if they could find any evidence of humans. And he came up with this basalt flake, which is estimated to be about 10,200 years old, that people were living on this drowned landscape, while a, which is now all underwater. Just amazing stuff. And this landscape was not only uh, occupied by humans, it also had lots of plants and trees on it. Here's a paper I did with a, with a graduate student showing that by 14,500 years ago, uh, there were even trees. These are four fossil lodgepole pine cones. Here's some modern ones for comparison. You can see they're the same. And this is wood from spruce and alder and other plants, and even some rarer things, such as this, this fruit here, 
is a fruit of Indian celery, uh, Heraclium. And uh, there are many other plants that were edible and, and potentially used as food. So there was a, a real terrestrial landscape that the rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age basically drowned. So is there any other evidence that people could have been there? And this is, the, I mean, the, the sticking point. You can say the environment was suitable, but were people there? And uh, some recent work at this yellow dot here, this is sort of a, a map of uh, the Olympic Peninsula. Here's Vancouver Island and the retreating Puget Sound Glacier at various times. But Squim, just on the northern edge of the, um, of the peninsula, just west of Port Angeles. And Squim was a well-known site. We're back in the 70s. Someone excavating a pond on a farm found mastodon bones and other animal bones. And the weird thing here is this mastodon bone had a bone point stuck in its rib. And in 2011, this paper was published in Science. This bone point was dated uh, at 13,800 calibrated years ago. Uh, here shows the point in here, and it's been definitely reconstructed. It's also made of mammoth bone, but they've done the DNA on it, and it's a different mammoth than the one that had the ribs. So this was probably an artifact made of mammoth bone that was used to hunt mammoths, again, uh, mastodons, sorry. And at the same time, as I discovered, right just up here, even closer to Vancouver, near uh, Orcas Island, Ayers Pond, somewhere in this area where it was deglaciating, at the same time, 13,800 years ago, um, Michael Wilf, Mike Wilson, who's down here, was co-author on a paper, Late Pleistocene Butchered Bison Antiquus from Air Pond on Orcas Island. Um, also at the same time, this is all pre-Clovis. Uh, amazing, this, this shoots down the Clovis theory because people were there at least 800 years before Clovis points were, uh, were ever discovered. So let's summarize what we've got about this coastal story. We know that sea levels were much lower, up to 150 meters lower 500 feet in spots, depending where you are, relative sea level, uh, during the last ice age and deglaciation. So lots of the continental shelves were exposed. Portions of it, that landscape were ice-free by as early as 18,000 calibrated years ago. Not everywhere, but certainly on Cape Ball and the Queen Charlotte's they were. Large areas were ice-free by about 16,000 years ago and not covered by ice. And then we had forests appearing by 14,500 years ago, all pre-Clovis. So the environment was there for people to be there, and it's just a matter of for the archaeologists to decide and prove that people actually lived in this landscape. So the landscapes were available for humans, and the Amerindians, or the early American Indians, as they were called early, they probably should call them now Aboriginal people or um, indigenous people, um, these were present at least 800 years prior to Clovis. And the debates around this continue and will continue for a long time. This map up here shows you the, the four sort of hypothesized routes for how people got into the Americas. Uh, one is, and this is because of Monteverde. This is the one site that proved that people were in the Americas before Clovis. It's not from the Pacific Northwest, but we know people were in Monteverde, Chile, 14,600 years ago, almost 2,000 years before Clovis. So, how did they get, if they came across this way, how did they get down here by 14,000 years ago, 14,600? Well, some people think that they actually made a Contiki-like cruise across the Pacific at that time, which is generally not an accepted theory. It's far too, far too distant. There was no large seagoing ships that you could bring your grandmother and your dog and your stuff and carry enough water and cruise across to South America. Um, the Atlantic route was, was proposed because of this reconstruction of Kennewick Man, dated at 9,460 years ago. Kennewick Man is from a site on the Columbia River just south of us in Washington State. And this is the, probably one of the most controversial human remains that were ever discovered. It's an almost complete male skeleton. Um, it's been under debate forever, and everybody get, has an opinion on this. First of all, uh, he looks doesn't look like a North American Indian based on the facial reconstruction. And then I even I got a, this nice, posy letter from somebody in, in the mail when after I gave a talk uh, in, in talking about Kennewick Man, and he can't read it, it says, Dear Sir, the fellow looks like a type of Russian peasant. There are many Russians like him. He's not an Indian. And then uh, talks about it has to be a Pacific crossing like Contiki. So everybody gets involved. And that's still, you know, the people that still believe that. 
And the real issue here is that many early man facial reconstructions from skulls look very variable. One almost looks like South Africa or Australasian. Uh, some look like typical Asians. Some have sort of what have been called uh, European features. And some people even think he might lo look like Patrick Stewart from Star Trek. <laughs> So this, this created a lot of public discussion about uh, where did these pe early people come from? But that's been pretty much settled by now. And some of it was settled in this paper which came out 10 days ago. While well, you're here at the last talk, this paper just came out in the journal Nature uh, from the Anzic site shown here, Anzic, Montana, a well-known um, Clovis site with a human burial. And there's a, a, a young child that's now been radiocarbon dated at 12,700 to 12,600. Typical Clovis, just before, not as old as 13,000. Um, but they did DNA on the Anzic child and came up with some conclusions. This is molecular biology and ancient DNA connecting with, um, with archaeology. And there's a, a couple of the main features that the argued, also argued that there was only one entry into the early Americas from one source based on the DNA and it was from Siberia, not from Australia, not from Europe. The DNA was clearly Siberian. And the DNA of this Anzic child is closest, if you match it, how similar is the DNA to other populations all across Europe and Asia? It's closest to other people in the Americas. So suggesting that it may have been very close to the ancestral population. In fact, all these red dots going all the way down to southern Chile, the closest connections are coastal. They're from Mexico all the way down the west coast, all the way down the Americas, all the way down to Chile. Um, so they don't make a big deal about this in the paper because I think some of the authors are archaeologists that are the so-called Clovis police. They don't want anybody earlier than 13,000. But uh, the evidence I think is they're building against them. And this also shows a much more accurate view of what the glaciers were like at three different times. Um, during 16,000 calendar years ago, it's blue. This was all closed, the solid ice sheet. Here's Beringia ice-free and southern U.S. ice-free. The purple is 14,000 years ago when the corridor first showed signs of opening up here in the upper regions, but was probably not a very pleasant place to, to be. And then 13,000 years ago, the ice sheets have widely separated. It's probably been time for plants to colonize and animals to get in here. And in fact, some archaeologists are now talking about that Clovis is older than, than they think, and then actually that the Clovis people you find near here actually moved south into the corridor from the south rather than moving from Siberia from the north. So, but that's a, a debate I'm not going to get involved with. And then you get further down the coast, about here in Oregon, just inland from the coast, is the Paisley Cave site, which also DNA has made a, a remarkable proof. There was a find in this cave of Coprolites, paleo poop. Here's uh, one of the, the finds, luckily held in plastic tongs. This could have come from a dog or from other animals, but the DNA proved this is a human coprolite. And it's been radiocarbon dated 14,300 to 14,000, again, earlier than 13,000 Clovis. So the, the evidence is, is now much, much more dramatic that. If you compare all of the roots and all the evidence from various sources, I'm not going to go over all this. This is from Raffin Bolnick, the same issue that published the Anzic Child. There's another article by Raffin Bolnick who actually show that the evidence is greatest for the coast. The genomic, the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and the archaeological evidence favors a coastal route as being the source. And it totally counteracts what most archaeologists have believed, that Clovis came down the interior first, and then anybody on the coast was derived from the interior to the coast. And it's now looking like if the coast was first, all these interior peoples actually were derived from coastal migrants initially. So this will not be, and it doesn't actually show the squim site here. This one is 13,800 as well. There's Paisley Cave at 14,000. On your knees cave up here in Alaska at 10,300. So the evidence is mounting that the coast was the route. Okay, I'm pretty much on time, I'm going a little fast for you, but that's kind of the gist of a lot of research done by a lot of different people on the Ice Age and the peopling of the Americas. And the coast 
as Knut Fladmark suggested, is looking better and better with every sort of discovery, as far as I can tell. Let's move from the Ice Age to our present geological period called the Holocene. Um, pretty much the last 11,400 years, it's post Clovis. It used to be called 10,000 radiocarbon years, it's 11,400 calibrated years. And uh, the last gasp of the Ice Age was a, a return to cold called the Younger Dryas. And here's, a, I, find, I love this cartoon because the, things were getting warmer and all of a sudden there was a return to Ice Age conditions, which some people have actually argued, help, here comes the Younger Dryas. Some people were arguing that this actually helped drive people south. Uh, from Alaska, but it's a little bit late for that. This graph here is from one of the many ice cores that have been drilled on the, uh, the Greenland ice cap, which record temperatures of the air as the ice was forming. You see, they're all minus up here, temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, but they record air temperature, which is uh, translatable away from the ice sheet to uh, warming and cooling elsewhere. And the red curve is a reconstructed temperature. You can see some um, a weird spike here, which is sort of this warming that was preceded the Younger Dryas. Then you get this big plunge into cold conditions again, which is the Younger Dryas. And then you get a rapid warming after the Younger Dryas, which brings us into our modern last 11,000 year period. And this has been very important. One thing I'll, I'll mention here now, over the last 10,000 years, there's been, after this initial warming was finished and a warm period early on, the general trend has been cooling over the last 10,000 years. And this cooling is, some people in the 60s and 70s argued that we were headed for the next glaciation. And in fact, of course, we're unlikely to be doing that based on global warming. And this was also based on evidence that snow was accumulating during the same time as, uh, as during the Holocene. And I'm sorry about, oh, let me just go back. How do we know this? Well, the ice sheets are one sort of evidence, but so, here in the Pacific Northwest, I look for evidence of this Younger Dryas and this warming event. How would it show up in the, in the forests of British Columbia? Well, so we had to go take a pollen core from a lake in the mountains and we did this at a couple of lakes up here near Haney in the UBC Research Forest. And this is a busy slide, typical pollen diagram. I don't I apologize for showing it. But just focus on this dotted line here. This is the Younger Dryas in blue. And this, right after this line, there's a, a sudden jump, everything changes. We go from a forest that was dominated by pine, hemlock, and spruce, and here's western hemlock pollen grain. Here's a big bowl. Western hemlock was starting to expand um, at Mike Lake up here at Golden Ears Park, and then bang, it stopped expanding, and what we see instead is a, is a large growth in three other species. Douglas fir, big jump, red alder, big jump, and teridium or bracken fern, big jump. What do Douglas fir, red alder, and bracken fern in combination suddenly becoming dominance tell you? Well, they tell you that it burned. And uh, these are typical conditions. And you find evidence when you look at lake sediments from this boundary time period in all these lakes, you find wood charcoal. There's all sorts of black bits of charcoal and ash. Red alder pollen grains is another one down here. There's a Douglas fir pollen grain. Douglas fir um, can be. A, on the coast, at least, is, is quite fire tolerant when it gets older and can recover. And it, but the forest would have looked much like this, disturbed, open, not dense coastal rainforest. And people have often asked me, well, when did we get our temperate rainforest, these giant trees you see all around us uh, that we've been logging? Where did, when did they start? Were they right at the end of the Ice Age? No, but we can, uh, I'll tell you that in a moment. But we know we entered a period of about 4,000 years when fire was much more frequent than it is today based on all the evidence. And when did we get this? The red cedar western hemlock rainforest, the one that we like. On the south coast, you get that outside our door here if you go to any of the parks. If you go up further north, the northern Red Corral, then the Queen Charlottes or Haida Gwaii, you get uh, west red cedar and uh, western hemlock over here and red cedar and spruce up further north. In fact, these are the, we know this based on high pollen grain. This is cedar pollen grain, and this is a western hemlock pollen grain. And sometimes when you're looking through the microscope, you think some of these things are looking back at you. I think Matt, who's here, found that, that grain. I loved it. It looks like a Halloween pumpkin. He said, hey, figure out what I am. Um, but anyway, so we now know that red cedar is really the, the indicator 
uh, along with hemlock and spruce for the, the coastal rainforest. And this happened after 7,000 calendar years ago. And I'm going to focus more on Haida Gwaii now, which is called The Islands of the People. And I have to put in a plug for the book that Daryl Feji, who's the archaeologist and I, co-edited uh, on Haida Gwaii by the UBC Press in 2005, which talks about a lot of the things I'm talking about in this talk, um, including some work I can't deal with on Anthony Island, the UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is the last best standing so-called totem pole site in, in North America, certainly in BC. Um, and we have lots of research there, but I can't sort of cover everything in, uh, tonight. But I wanna, what I want to focus on on Haida Gwaii and the North Coast in general is the history of cedar and red cedar. And this is linked to climate change again, this cooling trend in the, in the, in the Holocene uh, somehow led to a period when all of a sudden conditions were ready. The fires started to, to diminish and trees that were very fire susceptible and red cedar burns like a candle. It's full of oil, and it preserves very well, but if you, if you light it on fire, it burns like a candle. So fire just keeps it out of the forest. Um, and hemlock is also not very fire tolerant. So all of a sudden we get red cedar becoming an important element in the coastal forest about 7,000 years ago. And there's a connection because cedar is the key keystone tree for what we understand as the, as the typical sort of coastal culture. And cedar is used for everything from building large houses and canoes to basketry and clothing and ropes and uh, bentwood boxes and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't conceive of a, of a really typical West Coast culture without red cedar there. So when did cedar appear? And I'll get to that in a moment. But here this shows some of the uses of cedar and especially big cedar. It can't be the first trees that were there. You want to have really big trees to do what? To build giant memorial poles or to build large plank construction houses. Uh, in places like Skidans, when Dawson was, was there in 1878, the village was abandoned, of course. Uh, large seagoing canoes require large, clean logs to hollow out and build canoes. Um, and cedar was, was totally connected to the culture. Um, and the house where people always want to go was used a lot of large cedar planks. So how can we test whether there was a connection between red cedar in the forest and actual red cedar in the culture of the West Coast. And on Richard Hebda at the Provincial Museum and I, in fact, there, there I am, and there's Richard Hebda hiding in the, in the weeds. This is a, a large cedar house plank from Skyway, and it's over a meter wide. This was a big tree, and various people have reconstructed how these were, were removed. If the tree was blown down, maybe in a storm, um, natives would use wedges that they would drive in using a, large hammers, wooden hammers uh, with a stone uh, head, or they would use, these are not corn grinders, these malls were primarily used to drive wedges. You could use them as a hammer to knock wedges and split cedar, which splits very easily, is light, and preserves well, so it was the ideal building material. So, but these macro woodworking artifacts, when did they start to appear in numbers, and how does that correlate with, with cedar history? Well, here's part of the story that we published in Science way back in 1984. On the north coast, you find evidence for these, uh, more particularly the bone and antler wedges, um, actual planks, big planks themselves, uh, over 3,000 years old. Uh, malls are a little bit later in the north coast, and some of these implements, and adzes, adz blades, which were used for shaping wood, hollowing canoes, and so forth, and smoothing planks, really show up about 4,500 calendar years ago. And this is about the same time that when you go on the north central coast, these cedar pollen curves all grow up. So cedar was there, it was, was expanding, and about the same time, these macro woodworking artifacts uh, were expanded. And why was cedar there and expanding? Well, when you walk across the landscapes of Haida Gwaii and Queen Charlotte, the large areas are made of what's called bog forest. This is very swampy ground. It has these nice little bonsai lodgepole pine trees growing all over it, cedar, small stunted cedars, and, and you're walking in wet peat. So to find out, when did this muskeg landscape actually form? I had a graduate student, uh, Jeff Quickfall, who cored a number of lakes and not only cored them, but I got him to dig some, dig some holes. 
So here's Jeff digging a pit for me uh, to inspect, and we radiocarbon date wood at the base, and the dates come out between 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. That's when this wetting phase, the climate was right for both bogs and red cedar to expand on the coast. So everything seems to connect very well. But the bottom line of this is, there's a take-home message in this. We all know that climate affects forests. And we know that people affect forests. But it's, it's always been somewhat controversial to what extent forests affect people. And I think the story of cedar is a good example of the sort of reverse impact where the presence of cedar suddenly really promoted a transformation of, of Northwest native cultures. This is still controversial in some quarters, and every once in a while you still get a few archaeologists and anthropologists uh, that, that might want to argue, as long as you don't take it too far, um, most people are now accepting that this environmental connection works. And in fact, it works in lots of other places too. Can you ever think of a, a Chinese culture without bamboo? There's one plant that basically is used for hundreds of uses from everything from eating it, from bamboo shoots to building houses with it, rafts, uh, implements, uh, chopsticks, whatever you want, jewelry, ropes, pipes, kites, rafts, utensils of all description. And I think even more, you may not have heard of, of these, the marsh Arabs of Iraq, who lived in the marshes of southern Iraq, they were not friends of, of Saddam Hussein, uh, and he persecuted them, but these people harvested a grass, a reed, much like thatched roofs in England, that they collected, moved in boats, and built floating villages with their houses. Everything was built out of reeds. And in fact, I was amazed when I Googled this and found there's a mosque built of reeds, grass, a giant mosque built of, uh, you know, unbelievable. So having a single plant being a key element of a culture is not an unusual thing. Okay. My final um, third part of this talk is using the Aboriginal connection between plant management and what some people might call agriculture. And I highly recommend this book uh, by Douglas Durr and Nancy Turner, also published the same year as the book I worked on by UBC Press called Keeping It Living. And the title is Traditions of Plant Use and Cultivation on the Northwest Coast of North America. And I'm surprised that more people haven't picked up on this because cultivation is a term that is generally not applied to people that are considered to be hunters and gatherers and fishermen. How were they cultivating? Well, some of the examples you probably are aware of is that uh, camas bulbs. Camas is a lily, grows on Beacon Hill Park, all of southern Vancouver Island, around Victoria. It has a nice starchy bulb, a very important food for people of southern Vancouver Island. Um, but here it is in flower, the blue camas is the one, the edible one, but mixed in with it is a plant called death camas, which also has bulbs. And since these are harvested in the fall when the flowers are gone, uh, it becomes a question, you don't want to have any death camas in your dinner uh, mixed with your bulbs. So you want to be sure, you've got to weed these. You've got to remove them while they're flowering to keep your camas patches, ca you know, death camas free. And I'm sure the natives were doing that because there's evidence of large uh, areas that were tended by, by natives uh, for these bulbs. And then this is just something that's never been published, but when I was working up in the Fountain Valley near Lillooet, I came across this forest fire, and I looked at this forest fire and then checked out what plants were growing up in it. And to me, these are all bushes of Saskatoon berry, and they're nicely sp spaced, almost like an orchard. You can walk between them. There's no weeds between them. This was after a forest fire. No trees really growing up in, in these berry patches. And to me, there's lots of ethnographic evidence that people burned and, and tended berry patches. And I think this area of Saskatoon looks to me like it might have been uh, cultivated by people. But the real evidence, the hard evidence I'm going to talk to you about is has not been published. And I have permission from the, the Catesy band in Pitt Meadows to talk about it because it hasn't been formally discussed yet. And this is a Catesy wet site, DHRP 52. And I have particular love for it because it's about a kilometer from my house in in Maple Ridge, so it's right in my backyard. And uh, uh, Amy Holm, Tanya Hoffman is also an SFU PhD student who's now in Germany, but she's been working on this site along with Amy Holman. And we gave a talk on this somewhere else. And the story all relates about a very another important starchy bulb food like an Indian potato, and it's called wapato, or Indian potato. It's also called arrowhead or duck potato. And uh, it's a plant with a nice sort of arrow-shaped leaf like this. Flower, these are the flowers. 
and it often forms dense stands in shallow waters around the edges of lakes and sloughs in pit meadows uh, in the old days before it was diked. Um, and these tubers, these, these starchy potatoes, grow underground in the mud of these shallow basins. And when they built the Golden Ears Bridge, which was finished in 2009, uh, part of the, the work was done, and it's right here on the Fraser River, uh, in Pitt Meadows Maple Ridge. This area, of course, is um, on the Fraser River, which is a, a very important source of salmon. This is a land of plenty. We had salmon. There was lots of berry producing bushes, salmon berries and uh, salal berries and others, and Wapato in places before this was all diked and drained. <coughs> Alouette Lake over here, Pitt Lake. And here's the site, DHRP 52. My house is just under the sign here, so I can get to this. Well, I could get to the site while it was being done. Not anymore. This is what it looks like now. It's underneath uh, the approach road, Golden Ears Way, to, to the Golden Ears Bridge. But right underneath the site in 2007 and 8, um, the Catesy Band had a large excavation and turned up lots of artifacts. In fact, over 200,000 individual artifacts, including mostly beads, but lots of you know, points and other artifacts as well. It was a very rich site, and it's in a wet peat bog. So this site, over 200,000 artifacts. It's been radiocarbon dated. What time is it? It's about the same age as the North Coast people were using cedar and developing it 5,000 to 3,000 years ago. It's quite old. There was evidence of also houses nearby uh, that, that hasn't been published yet of habitation. So this may have been even a semi-permanent site. And I, I did some pollen analysis for the KC band on this. And what, they want to know what was the environment like? Does the pollen evidence of the Sagittaria, this Wapato, support that the plant was locally abundant? And is there evidence of actual processing of Wapato on the site? And other questions as well. Well, again, uh, this is the actual excavation, one of the, the big excavations. This is all peat. And they did a very detailed excavation between 2007 and 2008. And the Katsi First Nation um, is the, the owner of this territory and the information. And the classic view of hunters and gatherers is even promoted by their website. They basically show pictures of fishing and berry gathering, not of any cultivation. And maybe they don't cultivate like they do now. The real surprise in this excavation was they suddenly, in this peat bog full of organic peat, no rocks, nothing, they came across a layer of firecrack rock in the peat 3,000 years ago. And here's part of it. This is a layer, tons of rock forming a level bed that they called the garden patch. And this garden patch, also, you see these wooden things in here? These are the tips of what are presumed to be digging sticks, which were used to probably pry the tubers up uh, from this site. So this garden patch, this cracked, and this is fire cracked rock, so they were probably burning on site. This is not rounded river rock, it's shattered angular fire cracked rock. And right on, here's the rock feature, and it wasn't fully excavated, it forms a band below this peat. And right on top of it, these bluest things are the outer shells of Wapato bulbs. And in fact, there's a layer of Wapato grew right on top of this garden patch, which looks like this was a garden. This was cultivation, this was agriculture. In fact, here's, this is the only site where actual Wapato bulbs have been recovered from an archeological sites in BC and maybe in North America. And they collected, I think, you know, several hundred of them. The, the fresh bulbs look like this, uh, from the plants, but as they get older, of course, they, they get darker and, and, and different. And Wapato is a very important plant. It's a, the, the word means it's a Chinook jargon for potato, which is what it tastes like. It's a starchy underground tuber uh, of this emergent plant, and they were very important as harvested, and they were trade goods, widely traded by the, the lower Fraser River people to people in the interior who were very short of carbohydrates. So. If, so here's this amazing picture. Over 200 whole tubers were recovered from this garden site. And mixed in were clearly tips that had been modified of wooden stakes that were used. And you see the dark tips? They were fire hardened at the tip to make them less breakable. So these were actual tools used probably for digging up and loosening tubers from, from this rock layer. So this is quite amazing uh, because with the, the rock feature itself, the garden, it's probable that 
Wapato was actually cultivated, not just gathered uh, randomly. So I can make an argument that there was a form of primitive agriculture practiced by at least some coastal native groups. And was there evidence of processing? Because to make them edible, you had to roast them in a, in a pit with hot ashes to, to make them edible. And when I did my pollen analysis, all my samples were totally loaded with charcoal. These black bits are all charcoal along with, there's a Wapato pollen grain. There's a fireweed pollen grain. There were fireweed there and also some other rare plants typical of disturbed sites. So the wood charcoal, I think that's in all of this peat sample, in every sample, I suspect they were probably roasting on site and probably taking the old ashes out and maybe dumping them onto the garden patch to fertilize it. They may have understood fertilizing whatever, or they just blew in accidentally. I don't really know. But the story just becomes very interesting. So uh, all three of these stories, the first Americans, the environmental effects on culture of plants, and Aboriginal agriculture, all controversial. And some people still kind of don't like the idea and will we'll argue with you about them. But I think there's mounting evidence that all three are probably correct, at least at some level, even though I'm not an archaeologist. A few final comments about footprints, because this is about footprints. And we all know the modern footprint of big cities and 7 billion people is much bigger than the small footprint of the first Americans, right? And this is not the main topic of my talk. I like this picture of here's our urbanized cities, this gigantic foot on the earth. Um, and I think some other people toward the end of the talk, particularly uh, um, the final speaker, will, will talk much more about the footprint of uh, modern humans. And the term applied to this time period when modern humans have a huge footprint on the, on the earth is called the Anthropocene. And it may become a formal geological period spanning approximately the last 300 years, sort of since the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. The Anthropocene might follow the Holocene as the next geological period. And the earth will probably be transformed dramatically during the Anthropocene in the future. And uh, I've had some talks about this going way back to 1998 when I was interviewed by the Georgia Strait about you know, what I was doing and what does it mean and what does it tell us about the future. Um, and we all know now that, you know, and this is an actual photo of most of a, uh, an iceberg is below the water. This is what it would have, would have hit the Titanic way back, this gigantic mass of ice. All you see is the tip on top. This is what would have sunk the Titanic. But in Georgia Strait, when I talked about, you know, rising sea levels and increasing fires, the things that other people have already talked about. The cover picture on the, on the next Georgia Strait was this one. <laughs> now entering Vancouver, population 250 million, you're, on a, you're in a diving suit, the mountaintops are burning, you know. The news media have a tendency to hyperbole, to extrapolate and exaggerate uh, the reality. And, uh, you know, I don't think we're anywhere uh, near that or likely to be anywhere near that. But it's, that's the kind of thing that scares people and puts, puts it into your mind at night. And I do want to leave you with one important bit to talk about the future, because I'm supposed to talk about the future. And I showed you earlier the green and ice core uh, temperature reconstruction, just the last little bit over here, this last warming spike, this sudden warming up to, um, to the Holocene, and then this sort of Holocene last 10,000 years up here, 11,000 11, calibrated years. And if you look at this, this is what was happening during the last 100,000 years, during the Ice Age. Tremendous variability over short time spans. Scary, <coughs> tremendous variability. We have been, in the last 10,000 years, in the most stable and warmest period of climate the Earth has seen in 100,000 years and more. And that's something to think about. You know, how long is this period going to last? I doubt if we're going to be heading back into the next ice age, because the, these were things that were happening when there were lots of ice sheets around. The conditions were very different. We're in a world that's continually warming. But people talk about tipping points. You know, when, when do things change from one state to another? And we don't know. I don't know. But I do have concerns for the future, mainly based on what we know about the relative stability, even though there were climate changes, they were relatively minor compared to what came before. And I can't talk about what came before because I don't have time. But I'm going to leave you with some thoughts about the future. <laughs>
and nobody knows what the future is going to hold. We try our best to sort of predict what the future may hold. And I think this is a quote from me. I just made that up. The scientific method is our best tool for predicting the future. There are lots of ways people can you know, try to read Don Nostradamus or go to crystal ball readers or do all sorts of things, read their horoscopes. They don't work. Science is the way to get at least an idea of how the natural world operates and what it might be doing in the future. So more and better research. We do need the research. It's essential to continue doing research because if we didn't have uh, questions, we wouldn't need research and we have lots of questions. And I'm going to leave you with one quotation which I think is very meaningful from Bertrand Russell. And uh, I'd like to leave you with this thought. One must care about a world one will not see. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we're talking about most of these climate changes sort of coming to fruition maybe by the end of the century. And I'm not going to be around, and most of you aren't going to be around either, but our grandchildren and great-grandchildren might be around. And even though we may not be directly affected, it's important to take Bertrand Russell's uh, quote to, under view that we must care about a world even if we don't know what it's going to be. Do what we can to make it as good as it can be. So I'll leave it with that thought, and I thank you very much for your attention. Very rich talk. And the floor, as usual, is now open for questions and or comments. So who would like to be first? Let me answer one question before, any, yes. before any, anybody asks it, because somebody asked it to me before. When I went back to that <clears throat> green and ice curve with all the, the rapid fluctuations, um, some people say, well, you know, are these going to happen again? Uh, do we really know? And are the, is it a good analog that these things might happen again? And I think no. As I mentioned, most of those really rapid fluctuations that we know have happened when the world was a very different place. There were ice sheets everywhere. Um, the solar conditions were different than they are today. We're into a totally unknown game with the Holocene warming that's happening now. We don't know where that's going to lead. I don't think those last 100,000 years are necessarily going to tell us much. Um, but uh, the other question I had is that this rapid warming that happened after the Younger Dryas, which changed our forests from, from sort of wet coastal to this war fire-ridden forest, that might, in fact, be an analog for, if warming continues, what we might see again, wholesale forest changes. And I think our forestry departments are already looking at um, ways to sort of plant trees in places where they don't grow now uh, in anticipation that if warming continues, the forest will be very different. So. Good point. That's a very dramatic slide if you go back. So mm -hmm. look at that slide and it looks very dramatic. Now we have a question here and then... Actually, you just answered my questions. Oh, well, you were the one that, that asked... That last uh, graph was ice cores. And presumably, yeah. you, you can't say what happened in, a, in the 100,000 years before then, because there was no ice. Uh, there was, yeah, the, some of the ice cores go back a bit further than that, so especially the ones in happen, Antarctica. Right? So the, we have, in fact, we have some fossil air from some of those Antarctic ice cores, because when snow falls and gets compressed, it actually traps some of the air in it, and you actually have bubbles of air that you can actually measure CO2 and methane. And during these ice phases, the CO2, the carbon dioxide, and the methane are always very low, like 200 parts per million. We are now at 400. Right. So, okay. yeah. so, yeah, but the question was, if you go back into those older, do you still see those same fluctuations to the same extent as this last yeah, thousand years? Yeah, I think the history of glaciations are like that, that they show dramatic fluctuations. Maybe not quite as intense as the last 100,000 years, but they're still there. They're not regular, but they're there. Right. There was a question here, madam. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want to share it with us or no? Okay. no. Right at the back there. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if you could uh, comment on or, or uh, talk about the, the evidence or, or if there is any evidence to relate the Little Ice Age to uh, cultivation of the forests in North America by, by uh, First Nations cultures. I read that there was some evidence that uh, they, there was a... Uh, 
increase in, in forest density in North America around the same time as the Little Ice Age, and that contributed to a decrease in carbon concentrations in the atmosphere, and that re was related to the Little Ice Age? Is that... Can I just paraphrase? Yeah, that? yeah. Sorry. So, the, so first you need to tell us what, when the Little Ice Age was and what it was, and then is there a connection between the Little Ice Age and cultivation here with First Nations people? that you know of. Okay, Little Ice Age was the last sort of major cooling in our modern time from around, uh, depending on where you are, from around 1500, year, 1500 AD to about 1850 AD or 1800, around there. And the Little Ice Age was cooler. There is evidence that forests were changing in Europe and other places, but I, the study you've referred to, I'm, I'm not aware of changes in the carbon balance. I know the forests shifted, they changed due to this cooling in eastern North America and in parts of Europe. But I, haven't, I don't know if that's been detected out here in the West Coast. So. But sorry, I can't answer that for you. Is there a question at the back, way at the back? I try. OK, you hear me. Um, I was wondering, uh, thank you very much for this presentation first. And with regard to you know, your search for evidence of farming or cultivation, yeah. I was wondering if you ever thought about looking for evidence linguistic evidence in the language of uh, native people you know that could indicate that farming or cultivation has been um, taking place so question is is there any linguistic <coughs> evidence for cultivation in the first nations people that i'm not sure the main linguistics linguistics have played a large role in the peopling of the americas the first story i told because if you look at the map of north america and where different languages are spoken the West Coast is a far denser place of different languages in different places, all the way from Alaska down into California and South America. And yet the interior of the continent and people speak relatively few languages. So some people have argued the high diversity of, of languages on the coast indicates that the coast must have been colonized first and much earlier to allow all these different language groups to develop. But in terms of, I mean, there's a language for, um, you know, for the plants that have been cultivated and the berries often much more detailed, like the Saskatoon berries I showed, I think they're in the Lillooet tribe, there's about 10 different names for different quality of berries, whether they're big, dark, or juicy, or seedy. Uh, we call them all Saskatoons. They had 10 different names for them. That indicates a strong familiarity with either picking them in the wild, or maybe they were promoting certain varieties that were more edible and more desirable. So the fact that the language does you know, identify all these different berry types suggests to me that there was probably some interest in maintaining certain types above others, which indicates some evidence of cultivation. But that's as far as my knowledge goes on that topic. That's a, you'd think there would be some uh, link. There should be some words but for cultivating, if there would be some, some linguistic evidence for that. I'd like to say, can I make a comment before I go to the next one, that there's been lot, lots of work that has correlated biological diversity with linguistic diversity. So on the coast where it's very rich, you might also see Lots of languages, not because it's older, but just because you don't move around as much. Yeah. Because it's you can it's just, controversial, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. so. as most things are. Yes, here. Where I don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Rolf. Uh, and again, thanks for a very interesting talk. And uh, I'm just curious about that. Um, when you mentioned about the the rock layer, the fire cracked rocks. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on what was the purpose? Did they actually move the rocks there and then heat them, or were the rocks just naturally there already? Well, so I wasn't involved, I just, no. Oh, sorry, I, go just, ahead. Just, just paraphrase. It. Paraphrase, yeah, sorry. Shall I? No. Go ahead. Just so everyone hears, the question is, what, why, what, what was that layer of fire cracked rock doing there? Did they bring it there? And if they did, why? The archaeologist I talked to, this is a, was an important question. Is there some way that you could get this fire cracked rock forming, you know, a pavement layer, very flat, um, in any natural way? And the answer was no. There's no water movement. Um, it's all angular. It still has dark fire cracking burn marks on it. It hasn't been sort of moved from elsewhere. It's obvious that it, that it was local rock, fire cracked probably from roasting pits that were right on the site, that uh, from earlier roasting pits that were later used to actually create this garden pavement. It's a flat sheet. There's uh, no evidence that there's any natural process that can move angular firecrack rock into a flat sheet using water or wind or any other natural agency. So I think it's pretty sound that this was moved. And there's, ten, there's tons of it based on the evidence. They haven't excavated it. There's tons of this rock, and it's all of one type. 
and it's all fire cracked, which indicates people moved it. But that's the bottom line. The question is, what, why did they move the rock there? What was the rock actually? Who knows? For? I mean, uh, some of the archaeologists are speculating on that. Why? Maybe for identifying, you know, for enhancing a certain area that they knew, or maybe it was belonged to some individual who decided that he was going to try some new agricultural techniques. We don't really know, but apparently the, bulb, the fact that the Wapato bulbs were on this, right on this layer, indicates that it was there to t cultivate bulbs. So we need a gardener to tell us why we do that. The Dutch would have been happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Around on this side. Yes. How big of an area are we talking about here in the? Um, the side? excavated area was was like I think a couple. Of, they knew it was at least a couple of hundred square feet. It wasn't all excavated, but you could see even where the pits ended, the gravel continued on underneath. So some of it is still buried under Golden Ears Way, and if somebody wanted to really know that, they'd have to dig up Golden Ears Way and re-excavate it again, and excavate the whole thing and see what do the edges look like, and are there any changes in there. But uh, I'm not sure, it was big. They said it was definitely tons of rock, it's not just a few pebbles. So that brings up a question for me. Wouldn't, if you're excavating a site, isn't the first thing to do is to find out how big it is before you do anything to it? Well, uh, well, in theory, if you've got lots of money and lots of time, but this was salvage archaeology and they're always under pressure to do things quickly and as detailed as they can before the bulldozers come in to build the road or to build the bridge or to do something else. And a lot of these sites, you know, are not proper, not fully excavated, sometimes by design to leave stuff for the archaeologists of the future, and sometimes because there just is no time or money to complete the excavation. So lots of them are only partly excavated. Aaron, oh. and then over here. Hi, Rolf. Hey, Aaron. You were talking about the relationship between the First Nations people and the cedar. Yeah. And I was wondering, where did the cedar come from? And do you find that relationship between people and cedar in other places? Now, we focused on, on British Columbia. Do you want to paraphrase it? Well, so the question is, where did the cedar come from that appeared 4,000 years ago? And do you see a connection between cedar and culture in other parts of the world? The connection with cedar and culture, I mean, cedar, the natural range, is a slide I didn't put in for time reasons, but the West Coast culture region overlaps with the distribution of cedar, which goes from about Monterey, California, about the middle of the Alaska Panhandle. We published that paper in Science focused on the Northwest from the Canadian border north. I don't really know how much evidence there is further south, and cedar did come from the south, because the, the pollen curves tell us that it was there much earlier at, at, in Seattle, from the core in Lake Seattle, um, and it definitely came up north uh, along the coast. Um, but the evidence, apparently, no one has published it that I can see. I don't know if anyone has really looked. We made the case for the BC coast that there was this correlation, but it's a good question because, you know, how early? Because it could have started earlier in other places and then expanded north. Um, we don't really know that, and I don't know it. I've looked for other papers, no one else has dealt with this as far as I'm aware. So, another question to be researched in the future. Here, that's a question. Hi, Michael. Hi, thanks a lot, Rolf. Uh, you talked about the megafauna, about the, the large mammals. You yep. talked about uh, mastodon and, and bison and so forth. And many of these animals, bison excluded, but many of these animals became extinct around the close of the Younger Dryas, when you had these big vegetation changes too. Yep. They had been around, of course, for millennia prior to that, um, since time immemorial. Is it possible that their disappearance has placed us in a new situation that has never really existed before in terms of forest structure or uh, other community structures? What, what kind of effects would these animals have had on the vegetative community? Almost certainly, oh, it's a long question. Do you want to paraphrase it? Well, only to say what effect did this mega, beringial megafauna, the, its loss, mm -hmm. have on the ecosystems where they used to be found? Okay, the point is the beringial megafauna was found further south as well. We have mammoth tusks from the Chilliwack gravel pit up here. There were mammoth tusks from Vancouver Island. There's muskox from Vancouver Island. Um, 
the, many of these megafaunas were much more widespread. Mastodons were found all the way through the Americas. So these animals almost certainly had a major effect on vegetation because studies have been done in Africa on what effects do elephants have on African vegetation. And if you see some of the pictures, when there's a drought in Africa and the elephants are getting thirsty and hungry, they literally destroy a forest to get it, the leaves up in the tree. They'll knock trees down. They'll bulldoze. They, they poop everywhere. So they fertilize the landscape. The bison, when it was eliminated in, in the prairies of North America, uh, almost certainly had a major effect on keeping trees and other things down. And when the bison were removed, there is evidence that uh, the vegetation changed dramatically when these megafauna disappeared. So there's no question in my mind that these animals had a huge effect. They, they had huge masses. They were megafauna. They had to eat lots of food, mostly plants. Um, and that had to have an effect on what the, land, the vegetation was like. Quantifying that is, 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 is difficult, but just an aside to that, I'm, an unpublished paper I'm just trying to write right now, I found the first evidence in a 60,000-year-old site on the Queen Charlotte's, that's beyond radiocarbon age, where we have found caribou bones that don't exist there now, with coprophyllous fungi in huge quantities, the spores and the, and the fruiting bodies, the sporormiella and uh, a couple of other species that, of fungus that live on the dung of large grazing animals. And finding this in the, in the lake in large quantities tells you that there were large animals around pooping at the water holes and, and you know, these fungi were feeding on it. And I have the first evidence on the Charlottes from, from the early Wisconsin that they were there too. <laughs> can, can you give us a sense of, so you told us that, the, that there's, you've got some evidence now, or looks like evidence for humans on the West Coast on the order of 13,000, 14,000, I mean. If you accept, you, you and accept this, so yeah. If I accept the squim mammoth site, to me, the, the paper in 2011 put the nail in the coffin of Clovis okay. because, so, they, yeah, so I so, accept that. So let's say we're talking 14,000 years. Yeah. When did we lose all the big fauna here? Oh, well, I mean, people have made this connection between the peopling of the Americas and the disappearance of the fauna around the same time. And, but unfortunately, the, the disappearance of the fauna was not as quick with the Blitzkrieg model that uh, other people had sort of speculated. It was dragged out. And in fact, mammoths, the dwarf, dwarf mammoths survived on Wrangell Island off the coast of Siberia until about 7,000 years ago. They weren't all extinct. And certainly, many of the animals, the, the, the bison and uh, uh, and others that were there still survive. Moose, elk were there too, and caribou, and they're still around. So I think I would much rather have hunted caribou or something small if you're using a stick with a, with a stone on the end rather than trying to tackle a mammoth that could trample you and squash you like a fly. <clears throat> so why weren't they extinct or hunted? A question here at the back. Hi, um, I'm just um, struck by the, the native wild plants, the wapato particularly, I recall uh, in recent decades, farmers in Richmond and Delta and other places on the Fraser River Valley, on the Delta there, have said, given up growing potatoes. We can't grow potatoes here. And it occurs to me that perhaps they were trying to grow the wrong kind of potato. <laughs> Could we grow some of it? Can we, can, what if, uh, how good a crop is Wapato? Can we learn from the, yeah. from the Katsi band and cultivate the Wapato again? Uh, from what I understand, Wapato is, I mean, it's called Indian potato, but it's not, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's starchy. I don't think it requires much cooking. Uh, the camas bulbs require a lot of cooking, I think, because there's a toxic element in some if you don't cook them. Um, but yeah, no, in very wet habitats, potatoes will get rotten, of course. Uh, and the Fraser Delta has some very wet spots, particularly when we have a wet winter and wet rains. But you know, I don't know. There are no commercial wapato that I'm aware of that that have been you know raised specifically for cultivation. But it's certainly something possible. And and you know, with this sort of paleo diet that that is very popular these days, if you could start growing wapato, you could probably make a pretty good business selling them at farmers markets. But but no one's done that yet. So maybe it's difficult, but maybe no one has tried. That's an interesting point. Rolf, have you ever eaten one? Yeah, have you ever yeah eaten, I did. Eaten yeah. yeah, I roasted, I got one once, it was roasted, and it, it tasted a bit like a potato. It had a different, uh, it was a little sweeter almost. Um, I think the cooking brings out some of the, breaks down the starches and makes some sugar. So it was, it's different, but not that different. 
You know, it tastes like a little mini. There's so many varieties of potato now, too, fingerlings and the purple ones. They all have a slightly different taste, and Wapato is not that different. But it is different. It's, it's unique. You've got to try one. I can't explain it. <laughs> Are they related? Is no. It completely different? Yeah. No, it's, it's the it's family is Elismataceae, and the potatoes are in the Solanaceae, so they're totally different families of plants, not related at all. And also, I think the potato, potato is a tuber. The one I yes. saw there looked like a corm, most probably. Yeah, they call them tubers, but tech, yeah, botanically, yeah. it's probably a corm. A corm. Yes. Um, it's, it's not quite the same. But yeah, that's that's for us botanists to worry about. <laughs> so. Do you know why death camas and camas grow together? and Why they're so different? Well, they have similar environmental requirements. They're both bulbs. They both are spring, spring flowering. You know, whether the, how they co-evolved in some way, I don't know, you know why, but maybe there's some protection from growing together with edible camas. Or maybe it's just, I suspect it's just, they both require that sort of gary oak, open, grassy, uh, shallow soil environment. And there are other plants that also require that, but we don't eat. So it may just be not connected. It may just be serendipitous. Are they closely related, the death camas and the camas? Yeah, they're okay. both in the lily family, like asparagus and other things. So they're, they're a family we know very well. I was wondering if the wapato has any relation to taro, because there have been some suggestions that there was communication be across the South Pacific in early periods? No. So is there any relation between Tar and taro, taro is in the same family, the Aracy as skunk cabbage, and uh, a couple of other things that have, they actually have needles, uh, calcium oxalate needles in there, in there mixed in with their starch, and you also have to cook them right in order to make them edible. And they're in a totally different family again. There's no connection. And I know people like this idea of people crossing the Pacific, um, but you know, the kinds of vessels that people had 14,000 years ago were not ocean-going vessels where you could have water and food and animals for, uh, and bring your tribe and your grandmother and your kids over. It just, it just, Contiki showed it, but they literally almost scuttled themselves, and this was in very recent times, um, certainly not 14,000 years ago. Hi, yeah, um, I was just wondering how, if you know how Gary Oak would show up in the pollen record, and I've read that the management of Gary Oak ecosystems by burning would encourage chemists to grow. Yes. So, yeah, so something, tell us a little bit about management of Gary Oak by First Nations. Yeah, the Gary Oak ecosystem is a fairly unique one. Large Gary Oak trees in these open meadows full of chemists and other sort of spring flowering plants. Um, and there's lots of ethnographic evidence, and lots of books will tell you that there was native burning going way back to, in the Holocene. The trouble with all the native burning scenarios is that there's no way we figured out yet to tell whether charcoal from in a, in a core or in a sample is from a, a human-induced fire or from a natural fire. And these environments are also, it's, it's fairly dry on the south coast compared, it's, it's a drier zone. Natural fires are more frequent, but I'm sure people were burning. It's just the proof has is, is not been there. But we do know people own these large beds. They, they tended them, they weeded them, pulled out the death camas, and almost certainly did the burning. They, there's lots of ethnographic evidence that they did so. Uh, there's not much fossil evidence to prove that they did so thousands of years ago, but I'm sure they did. But that's just one of those things that maybe someone can figure out a technique to prove it. But burning certainly does enhance. It keeps the trees out, keeps the meadows open. Gary Oak, old Gary Oaks survive the burn to a fair extent, so those light burns are encourage the camas and keep the tree, other trees out. So it, uh, it does the purpose of keeping the plants there. Hello, um, thank you for coming tonight. I was wondering um, if you're not a supporter of the South Asia or South Pacific uh, migration, how would you explain Mount Verde from 14,500 years ago? I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, um, no. Being from such a high altitude. Absolutely, that, uh, but if people, uh, the best evidence based on what I showed you about the environments of the coastal route, I think they came down the coast at some point, probably between 15,000 to 14,000 years ago, before the ice-free corridor opened. The, the cor coast was fairly open. And people that crossed at that time, uh, I think Monteverde, they, may, they must have come even a little bit earlier, because I think Monteverde dated at about uh, 
12,400 radiocarbon years, which puts it at about 14,500 calendar years, which is about the same time. But if you're in boats and moving rapidly, you could have gotten, if you came across 15,000 years ago, when we know the coast was open, if people were motivated to travel, they could have made it to South America in the next 500 years. People have made calculations, you know, how long does it take to paddle a boat from, from, uh, from the Queen Charlotte Islands down to Monteverde? And you could do it within a couple of years, even, you know, allowing for stopovers in the summer and winter. So the coastal route allows for the possibility. The interior route doesn't allow for that possibility at all. And unless there was some kind of another miraculous crossing of, the, of thousands of kilometers of open ocean, um, it would have had to have been the coast. I mean, that's the best, best hypothesis that I can see based on the evidence. And I always believe, just because I do some forensic botany as well, and then if you talk to the police and others on a forensic investigation, you always follow the evidence. You know, it's not what people think, what people suppose, what people hope, what people want. It's what does the actual evidence, what, what are the radiocarbon dates, what are the artifacts, what are the bones telling us? And so far, they're telling me that the evidence is just that it could have come down the coast. Whether that ends up to be true, I think there's a lot more work to be done yet. But I think it is. Yes, madam. Just, it's okay. Just. Yes. Okay, um, I'm confused. Why do we have these two different types of dates? Why are carbon years longer than regular years? So, it's, yeah. so, so you, you yeah. told us that there's carbon years and then there's yes. calendar years. You said, remember, so why the difference? And I told you this at the beginning because not everybody tells you that and people get them confused all the time and you get even more muddled when you're mixing dates of one type or another because they don't tell you the same thing. Uh, in a, the short story is radiocarbon in the atmosphere which gets into the animals and plants and organic material is formed in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays converting nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. And this is based on the activity of the sun, how, many, how much solar radiation there is, how strong uh, these activities in the upper atmosphere are. We know from measuring in ice cores and others, the, uh, the sun is not the constant sun. It's variable. The intensity of solar particles changes over time. And the dates are different because the rates of production of carbon-14 were different before 2,000 years ago than they are today, for whatever reason. We can know that if you actually measure beryllium and carbon-14 um, in tree rings and ice cores, and it varies. And the thing is because we have tree rings that go back 14,000 more years and corals that absorb this atmospheric carbon. It gets turned to carbon dioxide in the presence of oxygen. It then gets used up by plants, and then animals eat the plants. And we have carbon-14 in our bones from the plants, but it was all created in the upper atmosphere. And because of the variability of production, you have to correct the radiocarbon dates to calendar years, and we can correct them because even back to about 40,000 years, because there's a tree ring chronology where people have taken year-by-year -year tree rings, measured the carbon-14 in them, and corrected how much has changed over time. And then you have a calibration curve, and you say, you read off the curve, okay, at this time, a 10,000-year radiocarbon date is actually 10, 11,400 years in real calendar years based on tree rings or corals. That's kind of, it's, it's geophysics, but the world is not as constant as people assume, and the rate of carbon-14 production is varied. Yeah. So if we take it, would there have been, if a year is a winter and a summer, or the sun going around the Earth, mm -hmm. No, Earth goes around the sun, though, but That's just right. just as a correction. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, <laughs> yes. Yes. But that's not related to the creation of carbon. No. So it would just strike me that carbon years are wrong. No, no, no. So, so wait, no, wait, wait. So, so, <laughs> so, so, the, so, the, so there's sort of two questions. One is why is a carbon year different from a calendar year, which we've understood is because the sun changes its heat, uh, the amount of light that it makes. And then the follow up is then what is a radiocarbon year? So you didn't actually tell us how you use carbon-14 to figure out an age. I don't do that. The radiocarbon lab does it for about yeah. $500. <laughs> but the, the physics of that is... Yeah, and this is a, a physics question. But in fact, I may have misled you by, by focusing on the sun. But it's, it's, 
cosmic rays are the ones that are highly energetic. I think the higher, this, I'm getting into physics now, I'm remembering my first year physics. Cosmic rays are sort of high speed neutrons, and it doesn't matter where, whether it's night or day, our atmosphere of the Earth is being bombarded. Cosmic rays come all the time, everywhere, uh, in a constant stream from all directions. So the Earth is always bombarded by cosmic rays, but there are variations in the cosmic ray flux and the solar flux. So the basic radiocarbon not only is tied to whether it's night or day or uh, how active the sun is. That's part of it, some of it. But cosmic rays are there continuously and constantly. And they're the predominant creator of carbon-14. So everything else doesn't matter. Something in the, app, in the universe is, is causing fluctuations in the rate of carbon-14 production. And you know, that's as far as I'm going to go because I'm not a physicist. But I think the idea is that, is that you get the carbon-14 and then it starts breaking down because it's slightly, right? And, yeah. and it's the rate at which it breaks down, like uranium. Yeah. That, that's how we can get the date. So we have a question up here again. So, so working with the theory that the, the, the first humans were coming down the west coast of North of America around 14 to 16,000 years yeah. ago, and they're traveling by boat, would, would you then expect that they were bringing with them provisions, uh, fruits, vegetables, plants, uh, animals? Ooh. And would you then expect that there be some evidence of species sort of uh, communication, moving, moving species that were originally more northern, more southern as a result of that? Right, so is there any evidence from the animals and plants that the first peoples would have brought with them the for big, their movement? Yeah. The big problem is that we have so little evidence from the coast except because most of what, if there was a coastal migration, most of it probably happened on this shelf area that was exposed during lowered sea levels during the ice age, right? Those sites, only one artifact has ever been found on the seafloor. Now I showed you that one little triangular basalt artifact that was found under 150 feet of water. But people that were moving on that early landscape, is, that is now all underwater. And you know what little underwater archaeology we've done to try and find these early sites has turned up one, one artifact under 150 feet of water. But to do this properly, you'd need underwater archaeology, millions and millions of dollars to have submersibles and such, checking all these drowned valleys and deltas for evidence of early habitation sites. And I'm hoping that sometime down in the future someone will take the effort to do that. But the reason we don't have the hard evidence, we don't have the fossil boats, uh, we don't have early skeletons that predate Clovis, simply because they're probably down on that continental shelf under up to 300 to 500 feet of ocean water. So, Underwater archaeology is the only way that we're probably really going to be able to solve this in a big way. And that hasn't happened yet. That's something for the future to do. Can I ask a question? What, what is the latest on um, whether the, for instance, the people that are in Haida Gwaii now, that you, whose culture goes back 4,000 years with yeah. the cedar, is the feeling that they have been there continually from 14,000 years ago? Or, have they came, or did they come up with the cedar? Years oh, no. Um, no. I, I suspect those people were there. Uh, they've been, well, we know we have people at north of the Queen Charlotte Islands at 10,300 years ago. So there are almost certainly people on Haida Gwaii as well. Um, we don't have any bones that old. There's, there's artifact evidence like that tool right. over 10,000 years. So people were there, I'm sure. And I suspect there are some things that I haven't talked about. There's some spear points from caves associated with bears that are dated at 14,000 years ago. But you know, it's not a spear point in a bear bone, it's a spear point lying beside a bear. You know, was it introduced afterwards? Did the bear come in after the tool? The tool itself can't be dated directly. You can date the bear, but there's no straight connection between the bear and the tool. But there is unsubstantiated evidence that people were there probably by 14,000 years when the ice recorder was just starting to open and the coast was already habited. But, and the idea is that it's in continual habitation right through, and then the cedar culture came later. Uh, culture came no, I think people. people probably, as cedar moved in, they may have learned. I mean, these people were, if they were seafarers already, they would have traded as they did now. They raided and traded with the mainland and with further south. You know, if, if cedar was suddenly expanding, they would have probably learned from southern cultures that were also starting to use cedar. This is the, the bee's knees to, to use, so this is what we'll, we'll focus on. So I don't think there was a culture change of different people. I think people probably adopted, uh, made use of, of nature's bounty by uh, when cedars started to expand on the islands. 
But yeah, there's lots of food for thought here and uh, lots of controversies and uh, lots of room for future research by people who want to answer some of these unanswered questions so far. I've been, I've been hogging the questions, I apologize. Any other questions or comments? So is there any, can you get contamination of pollen with major events? Not in the lakes that we're coring, no. They're well above sea level. Uh, I mean, we have done some work down here on tsunami deposits, and they often have very exotic pollen that shows up. But you have to have a source area, and you have to have a tsunami, and there's just no evidence that any of that ever happened. It's, depending on the site, it, it might be possible here and there, but highly unlikely. These sites were, you know, often you see laminated layers. They're undisturbed. It's a quiet settling out, not a big storm deposit or a tsunami deposit. Any other questions? If not, that is a good place to end because next week's talk is by Professor John Clegg on natural disasters on the coast. Focusing on earthquakes. Focusing on earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.